Hi, I'm Jan Engel Smith of Light Song School of 21st Century Shamanism and Energy Medicine. And I have with me today in this interview Sarah Marie Livings. And Sarah Marie has been a student and now is a practitioner. And I'm just so proud of where she is in the world with her practice. She is, um, the name of your company or the name of your practice is uh, Apothic Energy. Did I say that correctly? Apothic Energy. Yeah, Apothic Energy. Okay. And mm -hmm. I, I find that um, Sarah Marie has this really interesting history that has facilitated her in her shamanic practice and her Reiki practice, her reflexology practice. Um, because we bring we bring our history with us, but yet it's what we do with the history that makes us uh, positively influencing our practice. And I think Sarah Marie has done a beautiful job with that. But she was born into a cult, and uh, and she was also born carrying really strong innate gifts of being a seer and of the unseen realms. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting as she speaks of this because she was being told one thing with spiritual insights from the, the cult community, but yet it was mixed with deceit and greed and fear and power struggles and all of those different things that are um, contained in those types of messages. And so, Sarah Marie, I'd like you to talk about how you... Uh, have made th this history into helping people find their own truths mm -hmm. and how to create awareness and blending your shamanism and energy medicine and all the different things that you are now in practice with. So can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Um, so what's interesting about the cult mentality um, from my experience is that in one breath, they're speaking about love and they're speaking about unity and they're speaking about community. Um, but behind that message, and I think more overtly, the energy is often one of fear and one of being submissive um, and in alignment with the leaders of the cult or the tenants of the cult that have been created for the followers. Um, and as a young child, um, there was this facade that I saw of love and of acceptance within our community um, and a teaching that in that community was the truth and the only right way of being and that the rest of the world was wrong and scary. Um, and there was a lot of what I call brainwashing that created mm -hmm. a sense of fear of anything outside of the cult. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really confusing as a child because I could sense, I could sense the angels. I could sense the expansiveness of love. I could feel the divinity in people. And yet I was being told that the only safe people and the only safe spirits were those that were defined by the cult that I was in. Um, and this cult was extremely fear-based. It talked about more about the demonic realms than any of the other realms and how people were being actively um, assaulted or being actively um, like the demonic realms are trying to capture you or steal you or take you. And so you are constantly on the defense and sometimes on the offense, um, trying to protect yourselves from anything that wasn't um, Jesus or the angels. Mm -hmm. And why that was confusing to me is because I saw all the things. <laughs> I could see I could see the spirits in nature. I could see the different realms. I could see the spirits of people who had died and had not crossed over yet. Um, and there were so many moments in the teachings where the Bible would be referenced in such a way that it spoke to people who could see those things as being possessed by the devil. <laughs> or being influenced by something evil um, and malevolent. And so, so much about who I was, I was being told was wrong. And it was really confusing because I was being told I was a child of God. And if I followed these certain ways of being, 
that would go away, mm-hmm. that that would be evidence that I was in the arms of God, as if those skills or my awarenesses, my perceptions went away, and they never really did. Mm-hmm. And so as a child, I was left confused about why this God who wanted to love me and bring me into his you know, heavenly realms wasn't taking this from me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until, gosh, my later 20s and early 30s that I was able to actually relax into and accept that this was something that was a foundational component of who I am that it wasn't something wrong. It was something that I was born with for a purpose. And that you didn't turn it off. You know, I tried um, to, (laughs) yeah, you tried to, I mean, and that's, that's the common story that I normally Mm -hmm. hear is people turned it off, but some, for some reason it wasn't allowed to be, which is also, I think, indicative of a person's purpose and um, how they're gonna take something that they feel stuck with or um, Mm -hmm. damaged by and turn that around to really see it. I remember the moment where I I stopped trying to turn it off. I, I arrived at this place where I realized that I was just going through the motions of my faith. So the cult that I was raised in was later absorbed into a more mainstream version of Christianity. And I married a man at the age of 20 who was on the path to becoming a pastor. We went to seminary together. And so there was all of the, there was the framework for what a good Christian should look like. And I would go through the asking Jesus into my heart. I would go into the renouncing the devil and I would go through all of those things and nothing ever changed about me. And I remember arriving at this place of, okay, if if who I am is, according to the Bible, evil and wicked, and even if I go through all of these motions and I'm not changed, I'm still going to hell. (laughs) Like, I'm still going to hell because none of this is real for me. I don't feel Jesus in my heart. I don't love Jesus the way that the Bible is telling me that I should love Jesus. I'm just pretending. So I might as well embrace this fact about myself and if i'm going to hell then i'm going to hell but i'm going to have a good time while i'm alive in this body (laughs) and when i die i'm going to request a conversation with god about this system because this system doesn't make sense to me why would you create an entire population of people only to allow a fraction of them back that makes no sense to me wonderful that's that's great (laughs) that's really great I uh, I love your story, and I think that it it makes sense. Um, I experimented when I was investigating as a as a teenager. Well, no, I guess I was actually a young woman. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to look at all the different types of religions that were out there, so I would go to various churches and just see what they felt like. And so I know the lingo that you're talking about. Um, cause they were extremely charismatic in their approach. In fact, it had a fun quality to it on some levels, you know, cause it was, uh, very charismatic and a, a lot of loudness and declaring. Well, yeah, like a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church where yeah. they would take you into places of ecstasy and you would yeah. sp- it, be speaking in tongues in the Holy spirit. Yeah. 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 And mm-hmm. so, um, But I came to the same conclusion that you did was I just didn't understand the the divisions, the, you know, the separation of of peoples. And that was the turning point for me, too, because I I, to me that it didn't line up with um, love. It it was it it, there was just way too much judgment there. And I was trying to not judge (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) it just didn't line up with love so anyway i um again i was experimenting i wasn't i was just interested i've always been very curious about people's faith and what leads them into certain belief systems and so mine was just a pure curiosity 
Mm -hmm. But anyway, to, to move on to some of the work that you're doing now, um, you have a question here of, are we creating it, waiting for it? Is it coming to us or are we going to it? Mm -hmm. And you were talking about the idea of um, the new earth that is a topic that a lot of spiritual people are speaking of. I don't know about religion, religious people, but definitely spiritual people are speaking of. And your take on that, and I'll read that question again. Are we creating it or waiting for it? Is it coming to us? Or are we going to it? So do you want to address that, Sarah Marie? Yeah, absolutely. So what I think is interesting about this moment in time is that so much is being dismantled. So many of the systems that we've been operating in for a really long time, they're, we're seeing them um, in a different way. And I feel like that's a, a big part of that is the ascension process that's happening on the earth right now. Enlightenment is happening. We're seeing past the veils. Um, and we're recognizing that so much of how our world operates is flawed and it's getting to the point where we, we can't not pay attention to it and we can no longer subscribe to it. Um, and so we're in this place now of, okay, something is no longer working for us. We see that it's crumbling. It's being dismantled. Now what? And it's the now what place that I think we're kind of in the middle of. Um, there is no going back to the way things were. Um, I think the spiritual communities have been praying for a really long time for this moment to arrive or um, the things that we perceive as being more detrimental to the self rather than helpful to the self. We've been asking for a change. And I think even people outside of spiritual communities have kind of had this unconscious crying out for something to be different. All of the social justice communities are, have recognized for a really long time that the way our world works is not okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we've arrived at that place. I don't feel like there's any um, sense of <clears throat> urgency or, or even a need to be sitting with anymore. Um, that place of requesting for the ways that are, have been, the way that our world has been working to end. We're in the ending place. And so now where I go inside of myself is, all right, we've arrived at this place. Now what are we doing? Because I think what's happening right now is something is dying. And that feels scary um, because we're taught that death is the end of something. And we don't really talk about how with every death, there's a new birth, there's new life after that. And because we think so linear linearly, Death is the ending place. And then we don't really talk about what happens next. But right now, death is happening alongside of the new birth, the new creation. Um, and I think that it's important for people to kind of orient themselves in this place of chaos um, or what feels like chaos so that they can begin thinking about what's coming next. Um, and I, I think when spiritual communities talk about the new earth, it feels like a location almost, or like a place that we're going to arrive at. Um, and I think because of the way that we've been conditioned, we expect something outside of ourselves to show up and begin speaking to us and showing us what the next step is. Um, but I don't think that's what this moment's really all about. I think this moment is instead about going inside and figuring out for yourself what feels like the right next, and then going from there. And how would you equate that then to uh, the earth being a different vibrational energy and how people then need to deal with that? So I think that there's um, a natural shift in the earth's vibration. When you think about the cycles of time and historically when there have been the endings of civilization and then a new civilization rising up. I think that's just a natural rhythm of the way the universe works. And we're coming to a place now where that energy is moving really fast. There's like a crescendo happening. And that's why the veils are lifting. Like we can't not 
be um, influenced by the, the rising vibrations that are happening right now. Um, and so as the earth and the natural world is going through that process, we're, we're going along with that process. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, my understanding of it is that when you're in discord to that, when you're resisting something like that, mm -hmm. it can it can feel very disruptive. Mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, I wrote, mm -hmm. I actually wrote an article about crisis as transmutation. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned in that article how um, indigenous communities have created ceremonies mm -hmm. that actually create a moment of what feels like physical crisis so that you can access something more spiritual okay. because they they understood that those places where so much of you is being demanded and pushed to the edge like pushed to your personal edge mm -hmm. that's where the access point to spiritual knowing is created it's like a portal mm -hmm. that's created for you and i think that those those ceremonies that were um, routinely created for people so that they could be in a continual place of progress is happening worldwide, worldwide right now. Mm -hmm. I think that we've been knowingly and unknowingly crying out for something to be different and the universe is responding by creating this moment of crisis for us. So that we're all being pushed to our edges and we're, we're being forced to operate in a different way. We're being forced to change. So how do you recommend then that people go about this change? Mm -hmm. So going back to my personal story, I, I think I had a lot of moments of, of crisis, those moments where my life reached a place of such ca seeming chaos and such a discord that I, I had to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times that was me dropping what I've been doing and going to a place that felt right. There was so much of my journey that was navigated by my feelings about, you know, what my desires were, because I would be in this place of looking outside of myself and being like, well, this person seems to have it, or this organization seems to have it. And I would subscribe to that system thinking that that was the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so often there would be pieces of it that made sense but not all of it. And so I had to come to a place of just sitting with my own energy and using myself as the discerning tool for what was what felt right for me or what felt wrong for me. And honestly, it wasn't until I, I came into the light song community that I felt like I had any real direction mm -hmm. or, or real um, teachers that could show me how to use myself as that discerning tool with greater effectiveness. And so I'm encouraging people to seek out teachers, to seek out spiritual practices mm -hmm. that help them access themselves, because it's not so much going to the divine and asking for it to show you something. It's asking the divine to show you your own divinity, mm -hmm. to show you what your own, um, your own wisdom is. Mm -hmm. I think that we've, we've been, we've been taught not to access that. We've been taught oh, to... Yeah to go outside of ourselves to find the truth. And I, that, I mean, I know that sounds, it's like, it's very esoteric. It's very like the truth is inside of you, but unless you actually take steps to understand what that is and, and go through, um, you know, some of the techniques that like San teaches you and other spiritual practices teach you, unless you actually engage with that, mm -hmm. I don't know that it'll make sense. I don't yeah, know. That's not an automatic so just because yeah, you say I, I want to go into it. Yeah, I don't know that there's a cerebral component to it. I don't know that there's a word or a phrase that you can say that will make it click inside of you. You have to actually engage with that energy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and learn and learn what that energy is. I mean, there's, there, there's a very um, basic, basic, basic understanding of mm -hmm. redefining yourself. Uh, you know, you have to redefine yourself. And that's a, that's the basic foundational mm -hmm. thing. I'm also wondering, you know, you're talking about your seeking, what were some of the things that were on your criteria in that seeking that helped you say, oh, light song is doing this the way that I 
Mm -hmm. uh, would like, because I don't know if everybody takes a look at their criteria. They know that they're looking for something, right? But they're not sure of the criteria that of, of what it is that they're seeking. Yeah. So I, I am hesitant to say, to give the list of things that I went through, because I know that some of the places I went to that were not a match for me are a match for other people. Sure. So I'll say that I, I, um, I sat with different meditation communities. Um, I went into the into some of the more pagan communities, mm -hmm. and again, elements made sense to me. Mm -hmm. But the there wasn't um, there was something missing. Mm -hmm. um, and at my what drew me to Light Song, I, I I had a healing session with Karen Hefner, mm -hmm. um, and she was the one who pointed me in the direction of Light Song. And I trusted her completely because of how well she she worked with me in my own healing process. And when I went to the level one class, um, I realized that so much of what you were talking about and your intention was finding your self. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the most sense to me was that there's something inside of me that's crying out for me to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And the way that you you shaped the class was yes, we're connecting to spirits. Yes, we're connecting to the different realms that are that are going alongside of us in our journey. But you you helped us find a way to tap into our own energy to use it as a discerning tool. Mm -hmm. You talked so much about feelings. You talked so much about um, our feelings being cues and holding information mm -hmm. and that being a navigation system. In my entire life, I had been taught that my emotions were wrong <laughs> and that and that my emotions were lying to me. Mm -hmm. I remember those words coming out of people's mouths. Your emotions are trying to lie to you. And I'm like, how is that possible? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and one of the first things you teach us is in level one is how to read information through all of our senses mm -hmm. that our body sensations hold information and that we should trust that and like ask more about that and sit with those sensations. And I had not really found that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I thank you for that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, we we use the term um, inner authority that mm -hmm. you, you referenced this earlier where you said, you know, things, people tended to look for things on the outside of them. We call that outside authority where they're going to be told what to do and told how to feel and told what's right and what's wrong instead of finding that inner authority, which I believe is also part of the new earth that you're speaking of that... Mm -hmm. um, that we are in a in an actual time in uh, evolutionary growth, where we're moving from outside authority into inner authority, and that's part of what this this whole thing is that's going on right now. With what you're saying is going inside. The pandemic has created a template for us to do that literally as well as figuratively in our own spiritual growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sensing that there's, I mean, there's a very literal pause, um, but then there's this energetic pause and this hesitation. It feels like right now that we're kind of stuck in where we're noticing that things are going away and that inner authority, I think is, has room now to to come to the surface because things had had to quiet down for a little while we were allowed to pay attention to ourselves in a different way um, and i think that that is actually inspiring some some fear because for the first time like you said in human history we're being asked to go inside of ourselves and figure out what makes sense for us mm -hmm. um, sovereignty is huge right now um, and I, I don't know if people even know what that means, what it means to be sovereign, mm -hmm. um, especially because we're so conditioned to think that we need something outside of ourselves to point us in a direction. And so there's this, 
this almost catching of ourselves of like a feeling that sovereignty of feeling like we actually have power to make a change, but being uncomfortable in it because we've never been here before. <laughs> and I also believe, and you can kind of talk about this if you'd like, um, that people get confused with the word inner authority and or empowerment as a way to then inflict overpowering somebody or something else. It's like my first my first um, realization of this was when the terminology was about finding your voice. This was several years ago. You know, it was all about finding your voice, you know, opening the throat chakra and all this kind of stuff. And as I was witnessing people speak of this and practice this, I found them, well, they're opening their voice, but they're damaging somebody else. They're just, you know, they're yelling at people. They're just, you know, having this authority kind of thing over overpowering someone else in finding their voice. And I realized that that is not what finding your voice is all about. The voice is about love mm -hmm. and it's also self-love and it's not about taking power over somebody else or over something else. And I think that that's it, it, it's an inner it's an inner thing of of love that needs to be spoken and i, th I and the think... same thing with inner authority you know it's not about hurting somebody else it's really about not judging and and moving into a, a greater place of um self-confidence and self allowing and self-love that allows you just to be in a sacred space within yourself. I think what happens when people are coming into their voice or coming into their power is that there is a swing. Mm -hmm. So they're in this extreme place of being oppressed or repressed or or having to be submissive to something. Mm -hmm. And then as they're moving out of that, there's this extreme swing to the other side mm -hmm. um, where they, it's like almost like part of creating the balance is going to the other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. and then finding that middle place mm -hmm. after you realize, okay, the, ex the extreme opposite of where I was is not it either. And then they can find a way back to the middle ground and I also think a component that what you're talking about, like speaking from a place of love, that's kind of something it's different. And I think it needs to be taught and cultivated alongside of moving into power, because when you're in the place of being oppressed or being dominated, there is no love there. Mm -hmm. So you're not taught what love feels like. You only know how you learn by example. So you only know how to operate from a place of no love right so you're you're there you're submissive you're oppressed there's no love now you're coming into a dominant energy now your energy is a stronger one and so all you know to do is to reflect what you've seen mm -hmm. and so i think a, an important piece of teaching people how to come into their power is teaching people how to how to be in a place of love as well or teaching compassionate authority that's a mm -hmm. a major component of um of Karuna Reiki mm -hmm. is the the authority of compassion right. of operating from a place of love but of of firm boundaries as well mm -hmm. um, but not coming from a place of anger or fear but coming from that place of softness and of I'm, I'm so certain that I'm right that I can't not say something but I'm not going to come at this in an attacking way but as a like I see you and I need you to see me. Exactly. Well said. And at Light Song, as you well know, the way that we teach people about love is by working with benevolent spirits and uh, being able to merge with them. Because finally, I think when you are working with a benevolent realm, you get a sense of what it feels like to be in that kind of presence. Because we don't have 
those role models really on the planet, uh, at least not in our culture. Mm -hmm. And we need something to say, what does that feel like? Like you said, because all of our love that we have expressed here is conditional, mm -hmm. all conditional. And no matter how much you love your kids, there's still a conditional component on it somewhere. <laughs> and so what does unconditional love feel like? Which is what I think of as what divinity means divine love is unconditional love and so we use those benevolent beings to feel them and learn from them oh this is it this is what compassion actually is this is and the same with reiki you know you're running through a reiki energy through your body that allows you to feel something different from what you've ever felt before and and what's interesting about again coming back to feelings mm -hmm. allowing yourself to have those feelings allowing yourself to receive the vibration of love is such an important component of that mm -hmm. and so another thing that light song teaches you is to trust your feelings mm -hmm. um i want to go back really quick to you talking about um the conditions of love one of one of my more favorite things that you've ever said <laughs> is you said you journeyed to jesus once and you asked him if he forgives and he said no because i don't judge that's right yeah which i that was like a like a, that yeah. blew my mind yeah and in, in the beginning times of me being with light song because it made me realize how much of our personal interactions with each other and with spirit is coming from this place of, am I doing enough? Mm -hmm. Am I doing enough of the right things? Do I look like what this person or what this spiritual being needs me to look like so they can love me? Yes, exactly. And the thing that I love about journeying is, you know, you can go right to source, you can go right to the the person that's, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to learn from these words. And, you know, it was, it was like, tell me about this whole thing about forgiveness. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, it's a, he said, it's a man made concept. And I was like, what? And he says, yeah, it's a derivative of judgment. And since I don't judge in the first place, there's no reason to forgive, you know? <laughs> and I was like, I love Whoa. that so much. <laughs> And I think that's a really important teaching for the times that we're in right now, where so many people, it's it's very childlike where the world is right now, where we're, we're being given autonomy and being given opportunities to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And we're just so used to there being a right way and a wrong way that we're trying to find our own judgments. Well, what we really should be looking at is releasing judgment so that we can move more smoothly through everybody else's truths. <laughs> Cause everybody yeah. has a different version of truth. And I don't know that any of it's wrong. The decision-making and the discerning is whether or not you want to include that in your experience. And if and, you don't, then you don't. Right. And <laughs> what, what kind of result it brings. Excuse me, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, you, you you choose whether or not you want that in your life experience, and then you allow that, that people, that person or that group of people to continue having their experience, not trying to change them or be in a convincing place. Yeah, and I, for me, <clears throat> it's all in the results. Like, it's mm -hmm. how I end up then feeling. We're back to that point. Like, if somebody's telling me something that I um, I want to entertain, you know, like I said, I was very curious about religions as a young woman, and I was exploring and adventuring into these different things because I was feeling into them as, well, what's the result of this? Mm -hmm. You know, and what I was finding in some of those that you were talking about was that, well, the result was, is I'm judging other people more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And so that isn't the person that I wanted to be, that, that didn't align with who I was or how I, I look at the world. You know, I don't, I don't want to judge other people for being different. 
And that's a it, unique way of being. I don't, I yeah. think that we're born into judgment, even if we're not in a spiritual life We're we're taught what right and wrong is. And well, judgment and, is the derivative of the left brain, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's the derivative of the ego. So we're taught that from the very beginning. As our ego is developing, that's accentuated for sure in our culture. And, and I think most of the world now, too, because those right brain cultures are getting fewer and fewer. <laughs> but I think that it can be, can be um, also not on the agenda. I think that you can, you can stay in that right brain and, and in the oneness and, and have that type of attitude. I, also. Think, I think that's the energy that's watching over our planet right now. I think that's why there's such a, a call to the kind of work that you do and that the light sound community does mm -hmm. is because we're, we're recognizing that that left brain extreme place isn't working anymore. It's, it's literally feels like it's becoming obsolete. Well, like it's not a matter of like <laughs> it's not a matter of taking like a component well i don't want to say absolutely because we need our left and our right side yeah for sure be working alongside of each other yeah. but being only left brain is is what's becoming a way of life that can't continue like that feels yeah. like a certain that that will be that will lead us to to our end that's what it feels like for me or to um, a place that is kind of flat, like it doesn't go beyond, it just stays the same. We give a lot of lip service to oneness and mm -hmm. wanting to be um, in that non-judging place like you're talking about. And oneness is a right brain, um, mm -hmm. it's the lack of separation, you know, the the, the unif unification and that collaboration, when you really move into that in to the greatest extent, you're one with everything. You're one with nature and you're one with each other and you're one with the universe, actually. And so we have a lot of words that we, that we um, accentuate, but then we try to define them in this, this more uh, linear egoic place. And then they get all confused then with judgment. So I, I agree with you totally. I don't know if it, we don't, again, want it to be obsolete. Like you're saying, we, we definitely need both sides of the brain. But I think yeah. at Light Song, what we emphasize is let's learn how to be in the right a little bit more. Yeah. I think our systems are becoming obsolete. Yes. But what we're not and our left brain is part of us <laughs> yeah. and, and you i do recall teaching you know we breathe into the right side of the brain we wake that side up and we quiet down the left side of the brain but then in the later classes you do talk more about like making them work together mm -hmm. and about integrating both of the energies in such a way that they're working alongside of each other rather than yeah, to become whole-brained instead of lop, what the spirits call lopsided. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so tell us, tell us a little bit about your work, Sarah Marie. Like how, how would people, like what kind of services do you offer and how would people um, get a hold of you and, you know, it's, so, you have much to offer. I do. So I have Apothic Energy, which is my healing practice. I have locations in McMinnville, Oregon and Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, I'm accessible through my website, apothicenergy.com. You can just use the contact form to be in touch with me. There's information about what kind of services I provide. Um, I do reflexology. Um, I do Reiki, but primarily I'm a shamanic practitioner. So I work a lot, um, with the spiritual realms, helping people to engage what kind of healing works for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do things remotely as well. I, I also do teach some Reiki classes also, um, but mostly I work with people individually. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a Patreon page set up, um, patreon.com backslash apothic energy. And what I'm doing with that is actually more of this, creating conversations mm -hmm. around what's happening on our planet and asking other people who are connected to the spiritual community to kind of talk about their perception of, of what's happening here. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also trying to draw attention to how our system of exchange that's happening right now on our planet is clearly crumbling. And so asking people to start thinking about what's coming next in that realm, um, especially when it comes to healthcare and healers, um, it just feels so strange to me for that to be inside of the, the capitalist system. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something about healing and it, and I don't just mean spiritual healing. I mean, all the kinds of healing, Chinese medicine, Western medicine, um, the structure that it's trying to operate within, I think is really limiting. Mm-hmm. And so I'm asking people to think about how else we can support healing, um, in a way that allows healers to thrive, um, and have all of their basic needs met and still be able to have a family and, a, and a full life mm-hmm. without having to make a business out of, out of their healing. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the answer yet, <laughs> but I'm creating the conversation. And I, I just, I feel like that's part of the, um, going inside of ourselves and creating what makes sense. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think what's happening right now, as far as the exchange system is concerned, makes sense. There's such an organic component to healing. It arrives. It doesn't always fit in a one hour session. I mean, <laughs> you know, and some and some people, you know, it's happening right now. You know, people are calling upon you to engage them in a healing and asking them to come in four days later at a specific time kind of impedes the process, I feel like. And so how do we support healers in such a way that they can show up and arrive when the moments of healing arrive? Mm-hmm. And again, I don't have the answer yet, but I, I want to start that conversation. That's great. And so how, how do people engage with you on that conversation? Um, I am welcoming all people to uh, be a part in in the the public conversations. If they want to be a person on my podcast, I welcome them to reach out and tell me what they have to say um, or what they're interested in in talking about. Um, I welcome all questions. Um, Again, through apothicenergy.com, that's the best way to be in touch with me. Okay. I wasn't sure if your podcast had a different name. I couldn't. I no, think. it's all under Apothic Energy. I do have a YouTube channel, Apothic Energy. Yeah. Great. Most of my articles and and my conversations are held on my Patreon page. And a lot of that is accessible to the public. Great. That's that's a wonderful resource. Thank you. And I hope that people take advantage of that. If if anything, conversation dialogue stimulates creative thought mm-hmm. and uh, the especially when you blend it in with the spirits, there can be a lot of divine revelation that happens and, you know, various mixes like that. It's always, it's always fun to participate in those types mm-hmm. of things. And it feels good, you know, exactly. it's just like an empowering type of thing. Like, hey, I have an idea. And what about this? Mm-hmm. That's how it starts with an idea. Uh, mm-hmm. this, you know, the spirits have always said that we're not really in charge with the solutions, but we are in charge of holding frequencies, you know, so when you can have Mm. conversations that are really of a higher frequency, you know, like opening and uh, there's a lot of room there for, again, this intervention that that happens um, because you're at the frequency of receiving those solutions in a, Mm -hmm. in a good way you know, in a way that in a fun way, in, in an a exciting way. way. Yeah. Not in a pleading, please help me kind of way, but like, I'm curious, I'm wondering. Mm-hmm. 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 Wonderful. Let's see if there's another thing that I wanted to ask you about. Um, well, you had, you had keeping on the, um, on the topic of the new earth. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was, um, uh, we're no longer in a place of praying for what is no longer working to go mm-hmm. away. We have arrived at a place of dismemberment. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Dismemberment. Yeah. So the lights on teachings, but how, how I've understood dismemberment, um, give a visual example. And I've talked about this on my podcast, actually, with Amber Jean. 
um, when we go into a spiritual journey and we're asking for something to be different, a lot of times our our spirits will will go through a process of literally tearing our physical bodies apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and while it visually looks scary and, and it feels like we're being killed or like something mean and unkind yeah. is happening to us, in truth, it's the, the greatest gift that they could be giving us because they're they're tearing apart the foundation of where our belief systems are held. They're taking away um, the framework and the structures that hold the energy of a belief in our physical bodies and our spiritual bodies. And when that energy is freed and the framework goes away, then we're in a place, we're in a true place of of creation. Um, And I think that that's what's happening on our planet right now is that the foundation of everything we've believed in is crumbling and going away. Our earth is our, our world, our systems are being dismembered so that we can, it's almost like a blank slate. And we're going back to a place of, we're going back to the drawing board. And there's these original blueprints that the spirits have shown me that we're going back to. Like mm. we're we're not dying as a people. We're like our our humanness is is remaining, but the programming, all of the constructs are what are being taken away. But truly, it feels like we're being brought back to infancy in a, in a in a lot of ways. We're dying, but we're staying in our bodies. But our souls are arriving at this place of a new beginning but we're grownups, we're, we're, we're adults. And so we're going through a learning process that, that feels like, like childhood. Like we're moving through infancy, childhood and adolescence in these grown up forms, um, which can mm. feel a little disorienting. Yeah. <laughs> but when you, when you, when you're in the mindset of, of I get to do this instead of this is something that's happening to me, like this is something different and new that humans have not been asked to do before, then it can feel a little more exciting. Um, and it, it requires, as we've spoken about, finding that that inner authority mm-hmm. and going to that place of understanding who you are, who I am, mm-hmm. and who am I in the context of my community. And how do I want to engage my community? I get to decide now. I get to pick. I don't have to follow these five options. Mm-hmm. Choices is a whole, is, <laughs> I could talk a lot about choice, but we're in a, in a moment of choice. And it's not that we're being given five options and being told you're free to make a choice. I feel like that's how it's been. Like you're giving a set of options and said, you are, you're free to make any of these choices, but that's a limited set of choices. True freedom is creating the choices that you choose from, creating the options. Mm-hmm. And that's where it feels like we are now. And that can feel kind of scary sometimes for people. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how, do you, how do you explain that? Like if they're going, I don't know what to choose. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know how to create a choice. What do you mm-hmm. recommend for that? So for for me and how I how I work with my clients and my people is you have to cultivate a, a trusting of yourself because mm-hmm. I think we're born and we're raised to believe that we can't trust ourselves, especially if you're in a, a more religious community. You're taught to look outside of yourself to to beseech God or beseech the people who the voice of God is speaking through mm-hmm. to find out what truth is, and so. Right now, I think it's demanding us to really settle into ourselves and feel our own feelings and think our own thoughts. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think it means you have to, you know, start a program or, or even start like a, a training or an education. I really think it just means sitting and feeling yourself. Mm-hmm. What feels right to me? What feels good to me? What doesn't feel good to me? And being comfortable if what doesn't feel good to you is a, is a in contradiction to everything you've been taught. Mm-hmm. It's embracing yourself, embracing the fact that who you are might not be a match for where you have been. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and going from there, it grows organically from my own experience and from observing other people. It starts with being comfortable with who you are being different than who you've been and who you are 
not being a match for your current life circumstances. And once you can like accept that and know that and feel that in your body, then everything else comes after that. And it's not even a thinking place. It just, it just happens. There's a net. Na- that's the magic. <laughs> <laughs> that's the magic of what we're talking about. You don't know how it happens. It just does. Mm-hmm. Again, another right brain um, experience is mm-hmm. magic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautiful, Sarah Marie. I, I hope that people are inspired by what you're talking about and that they contact you and receive mm-hmm. some of your services. And I, I do want to give a shout out to Karen Hefner. You mentioned her as the person that um, led you to us. And Karen mm-hmm. is a, also a teacher for the school and, um, you know, plays a very active role. And, and it's nice to give honor to these people that have had these mm-hmm. major life changing experiences you know they've helped facilitate that for you or giving you the permission to go through it for yourself so, absolutely yes yeah. for that mm-hmm. yeah so thank you very much and again if you want to contact uh sarah marie it's apothic energy and it's www right that's the yeah www.apothicenergy.com yes yeah, there you go and you can see all the different services that she offers in locations and you are working primarily virtual now or do you actually see it's, people I've, it's a mix it's all of it okay. however people need me to show up for them i can mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. good yes well, thank you again and thank you so much yeah it's been fun mm-hmm. bye-bye for now bye now <laughs>